Megan McEnany, who's recently become a psychiatrist, collaborated in some of the work that I did in Honduras. Um, and uh, Megan's gone to the West Coast as a psychiatrist there now. Maria Venegas is a former student in our department who completed her uh, master's thesis on the topic of nervios, which I'll be talking about a little bit today in anthropology, and also uh, visited the community with Dr. Koster, who's the next thanks I have to give, uh, did his dissertation research back in 2004, 2005. Uh, in Nicaragua and the Bosales Reserve, and she went down uh, with him and helped get some of the footage and the information we have about what I'm going to be talking about today. And Jeff Heck, some of you may know the name, he runs the Shoulder to Shoulder Program, it's in Honduras, it's started here at UC, and it's a partnership that uh, really is meant to provide health care to uh, uh, very poor rural citizens. And Christy O'Day, who I've discussed this with a lot, Christy is one of the doctors who was hired by Shoulder to Shoulder American to stay there for a couple of years, she took her family down there, and We've talked about this, what to name it, because it doesn't have a name, some of these things, and she said, I'm, there's times when I want to have one of these too, and I'm trying to figure out how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can see maybe a little later uh, how that could happen. Um, a couple things I want to do today. Uh, one is just to present a couple of case studies about two unusual and fairly dramatic forms of distress, and compare and contrast these in two small communities in Central America. I uh, also want to question, in a sense, a number of boundaries and dichotomies um, between psychology and sociology, between anthropology and psychiatry, mind, body, individual, society. I think a lot of these kinds of things break down when we look at the expression of distress in, in small communities, and we'll see some examples today. I also want to emphasize the importance of uh, comparative approaches. A lot to squeeze these two communities into this talk, but I think it's very important to look at what may be similar phenomena being expressed in different social ecologies. Uh, and I'm going to be really focusing on kind of a meaning-centered approach to these and what I call sociosomatic idioms of distress. I'll talk more about that later. I'm training, my training is largely in the humanistic, interpretive, and constructivist uh, field. So I'm, I, I take a somewhat critical view of uh, biomedicine and psychiatry, but I'm very collaborative and I work with these people and I can't, uh, I can't stand apart too much. And so I do try to incorporate interpretive into uh, more positivist uh, kinds of thinking. And then I also want to suggest the idea that while it's context that I think is very important for understanding these, it's uh, context is always kind of on the outside. It's this internal external dichotomy that we have in our thinking too. And that um, we can also think about the social and the cultural as ontology, as being itself, as a, as a, pl as a place of reality itself, in the sense that we are social beings. Human beings are social from, from the very first moment that we open our eyes and the world, you know, mom's there. It's that connection. And I think, uh, you know, recent work in, in cognitive sciences on mirror neurons and other things really suggest the way that we understand each other is at a, a level different than just thinking. Um, so, carried away. The trance-like phenomena that we're talking about are notoriously difficult uh, and have been notoriously problematic in terms of defining Western psychiatry and cross-cultural psychiatry. Um, and they're also, if you can group them together in the way that I'm going to do, uh, they appear to be very highly culturally and uh, socially elaborated so that we see very different forms historically uh, and we see very different forms geographically as we go across places and culturally. The metaphor of being carried away, as in um, emotion, getting carried away, getting emotionally over-involved in something, I think is a, is a useful way to kind of begin to understand these phenomena. And um, in English, the term carry away is a, a metaphor, what's called a sleepy metaphor. It's one in which we've kind of lost memory of where it came from. But none of us really have a problem understanding the metaphor. We don't see it as a direct metaphor like something like you are a flower, you are, you know, it's clearly metaphorical. This is a hidden metaphor, and, if, and metaphors also are, you know, have been studied a lot by, by cognitive scientists and, and linguists and are often associated with embodiment. And so the idea of being carried away can be an idea, but it's also a sensibility that we have. It's we think with our bodies about this, and metaphors have us and help us think with our bodies. Being carried away is also analogous to what's going on in these communities, or at least it's a metaphor for what's going on. Uh, something negative takes possession of the subject, uh, embodied metaphor, again, being a vehicle for understanding and expressing emotion and meaning. And a lot of times, linking the cognitive, the social, and emotional, 
come together. And it may be in that linking, you know, whether we think of it inside the mind or in society, it may be part of the strength that, that gives um, these illnesses their form. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, how metaphor itself may be part of the expression of distress in these communities. Uh, and this is, I'm really just taking off in this area, and a lot of this is preliminary, so I'm kind of asking you to, to help me think through some of this. One of the two illnesses that I want to talk about, and I use the word illness loosely, and I'm referring to these as sociosomatic idioms of distress, is greasy sickness. And this is a, a creolization of the English term crazy sickness in the mosquito language. Uh, and the people uh, among whom it's been witnessed include the mosquito primarily in the Mayanga communities of Lowland Eastern Nicaragua, which is in a, uh, a reserve, a protected area of Lowland, uh, new tropical Eastern Nicaragua. The form of this illness is a highly externalized trance state. The person is agitated, it involves aggressive acts, running into the forest. It's commonly among women and uh, those who are socially marginalized. It also has uh, these characteristics which, which we might call social or emotional contagion, and that you have to see it. Uh, and then when someone else is distressed, it distresses you, and, and there's a sense of contagion that can be carried on. And from what I understand from Jeremy, several people in the community can get this at the same time. And I've read reports of groups of young men being at the same time, and really causing and really cause big problems. It can be associated with uh, stressful events. The other one in Honduras, one that I've had much more experience with, is um, a nervios susto ataque syndrome. And I'm kind of proposing to put these three terms together. Um, and this is among rural mestizo Hondurans. The other uh, more of an indigenous population. This is a Spanish speaking uh, population in southern Honduras. And in this case, the form of the illness presentation is highly externalized. It's a cataleptic trance state where you basically have a seizure, fall out, become unconscious, and remain in catalepsy. You, 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 you're stiff and paralyzed and laying down. Um, again, it's fairly common among women, but the case I'm going to present today is a young man. It's also social, socially contagious. The young man that had it saw his aunt have one the day before all around a wedding in which there was some fighting and disturbances going on. And you can see it's associated with <coughs> funerals, graveyard, people even going into the graveyard. That's where I noticed some of the Nahuatl beliefs are still part of uh, the way they think of graveyards and the spirits that are left behind. So a few questions. Are these diseases, illnesses, or idioms? Are they the same? And if so, uh, what accounts for the very different presentations? And can we think of them as being socially and metaphorically so I need to give you a little bit of background on these phenomena in the sciences um, and in anthropology as well. The, the narrative of anthropology that has had some interest in trans phenomena in general is, goes under the rubric of altered states of consciousness. I'm going to say a few things about that. Another area uh, or another kind of label in the literature is what's known as idioms of distress. I think that's something that maybe we can at least imagine what it means. We haven't heard of it, but it has a certain kind of social expressive nature of thinking about the way people get symptoms. Culture-bound syndrome, some of you may have heard of these. These are these kind of unusual exotic syndromes that have been listed at the end of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and they reflect what appear to be kind of bounded psychiatric entities in different cultures around the globe. And I'll talk more about those in a moment. And, and then the literature in Western psychiatry and in Anglo-European psychiatry of hysteria, conversion, and dissociation is very important here because these phenomena, I think, are, are largely what I'm suggesting are, are going on here. And they're all metaphors themselves, of course. Uh, hysteria was uh, you know, it's a big term for, for the uterus, and it was associated with women. Conversion, you're converting you know, a emotional distress into a somatic manifestation of paralysis. And dissociation, where you compartmentalize memory or certain kinds of experience, and maybe you forget about it, but it gets triggered every once in a while. And it's part of our thinking about what PTSD is, to a certain extent. The DSM has tried to add something so that they can, you know, when, it's, when it is pathological and needs to be treated, they've tried to add something they call possession and trance syndrome. And, and it also covers some of what we're going to talk about. But I think in, in very general terms, we can kind of stick with the language of, the descriptive language of, of psychosomatic and sociosomatic illness uh, as we move on. This is um, a, a behavioral continuum, a phenomenological behavioral continuum that represents 
uh, some of the work that was done on altered states of consciousness by Eric Gaborian up at uh, Ohio State uh, back in the 70s. And she used uh, some catalogs of, of ethnographies and things and went and searched all cross-culturally in the ethnographic record about what kinds of altered states of consciousness are people report, what kinds of ritual activities, etc. And she divided these after looking at them and studying them for a while into trance and possession trance. These are two types of trance. Trance where you go under and you become still and you receive some message and you come out and you